In the world of finance, names can be a bit misleading. Take ours, for instance. Pronounced LSEG, aka London Stock Exchange Group. Sure, we're in London, but we're also here, here, and here. In fact, we do business in 190 countries. We're practically everywhere, except here. Well, not yet anyway. We're proud to be one of the world's biggest, most international stock exchanges, connecting capital with ideas for centuries. But that's just part of what we do. Today, we connect the news, information, insights, and systems to create possibility across the markets, partnering with almost every major financial firm in the world. You see, others do some of what we do, but not everything we do. Instead of LSEG, we could have called ourselves the London and practically every other place in the world stocks, bonds, currency, data, analytics, indices, risk management, clearing exchange, multi-asset class group. But that's a little wordy. LSEG. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning and warm welcome to the Future of Wealth event, where we are joined by our Reuters partners and by Mr. Philip Rickenbacher, the CEO of Juliusberg Group. Uh, my name is Jana Martinuk. Uh, I'm an account director at LSEC, and I am absolutely delighted to be here with you today at, in this beautiful location to discuss the future of the Swiss wealth management industry. Same as other industries, this, the uh, wealth management segment is uh, facing challenging times, which bring lots of uncertainties, changes, but also lots of opportunities. So we're here today to discuss those and hopefully get an optimistic outlook for the future. Having said that, please kindly join me in welcoming on stage, as already on stage, uh, Ms. Uh, Luisa Martinuzzi, uh, who is uh, Reuters EMEA Finance and Markets Editor and Mr. Philip uh, Rickenbacher himself. Thank you, Jana. Um, a few housekeeping notes, I'll keep it very brief. Um, Philip and I will have a conversation, but rest assured you will have time to ask some questions at the end, so um, bear with us while we get through our conversation. Philip, thanks so much for joining us on this Reuters Newsmaker event with LSEG. Um, as Jana said, it is um, an interesting time to be having this conversation, not least given what we've seen happen this year in the industry, particularly in Switzerland. It is the biggest offshore market for wealth. It's also been through quite an interesting few months with the demise of one of the bigger players. Um, and there's quite a lot going on um, globally that is affecting the, the industry. Um, Philip, you've been with, in your role, since 2019, you've uh, had different roles in the past. You were head of structured products. You were um, at UBS. You were at McKinsey. Gives you a great uh, background to be engaging in this conversation. Um, given your, you know, the institution that you lead, 133-year-old, um, you oversee just shy of half a trillion dollars for rich clients. You've got a unique insight into how this clientele views the world that we're living in, and more importantly, the financial opportunities that lie ahead. Um, I thought we could start with, with some macro questions, and um, you know, we're reaching a point in the inflationary and interest rate cycle where we might be seeing a peak, and I'd love to hear how you see clients positioning themselves in, in this phase. Thank you very much indeed, Louise. And pleasure to be here and uh, looking forward to having that conversation today. Yes, there's a lot to talk about and uh, you've, you've made already a big arc in, 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 in your uh, introduction. I think it's a good time to be a wealth manager today and I'm sure we're going to talk more about that. And it's a time when our clients need us probably more than ever. And I've kept saying that over the last three years throughout the pandemic with all the, uh, with all the changes around us. And I think it's uh, even more true as we are now in 2023 with a very complex geopolitical and macroeconomic environment and a lot of uncertainty on how the glide path uh, or the brake path uh, moving forward is going, is going to look like. Now, when it comes to interest rates, obviously this is one of the, one of the, the, the determining elements of, of this environment. I think uh, typically private clients would always be slightly behind the curve when it comes to those developments and uh, compared to institutional clients, compared to the, compared to the financial markets. And uh, obviously, I mean, what has happened over the course of the last year, one and a half, is that private clients have rediscovered 
positive interest rates. That's something that is already, how would I say, uh, so much behind us in a way looking at it professionally. But I think for many private clients, this is, this is still a completely different phase that has started after years, long years, of negative interest rates and uh, of uh, the respective implications on investing. And so what we do see is that clients hold, I think, more cash, uh, interest-bearing cash. Uh, they are seeking for uh, interest rate opportunities out there in the market. And on the other side, I think, uh, yes, they still know that cash will never beat being invested in the market in the long term. But with the current unclarity about where the direction of the market is going, will the U.S. really make the soft landing? How deep is uh, uh, the, the trial going to be in Europe and what's happening in China? I think the propensity of investors today to invest in the capital markets is a little bit muted. And uh, that's, that's the situation that we have now at mid-23. And so given the slag that you're talking about, are you, are you expecting clients to put more into cash going forward? And how, how do you... No, I don't expect that. I think that, the, 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 let's say, the, the cash allocation has happened. The question is how fast will clients deploy that cash again in the, in the, in, in the financial markets? And I think uh, uh, in the current environment, that speed will probably be a bit slower than in the past years when uh, obviously holding cash was uh, akin to immediate value destruction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, how does that affect your business then in terms of the, the returns, uh, the opportunity for returns? Very solid interest rate result and you've seen our first uh, half year result and obviously I think the industry is benefiting from positive interest rates and uh, we've been able to let's say, repair our P&Ls uh, 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 after the, uh, the, the long time of negative interest rates, I think, which has heavily affected banks and also wealth managers. On the other side, a little bit of slower transaction uh, uh, turnover and, 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 and lower client activity, I think that's also what we've reported mm -hmm. in the first half year. I think this comes very consistent and in a very logical way uh, together. And has that continued into the second half? Well, you know that a change in client behavior always requires a change in external conditions in a way. And uh, I think these things happen fast. We've seen them happen very fast in the past. Investors can, can, can re-find confidence, for example, in, in market direction, in market trends, but they have to show themselves clearly. And I'm not quite sure reading the press and reading Reuters and reading uh, all the news channels. I'm not quite sure whether that level of certainty uh, is already reached right now. Um, I wanted to take a step back and, and continue sort of the, the more macro um, conversation. And um, you mentioned uh, politics and geopolitics. And, you know, we're living in an era of, of heightened geopolitics. And some of the globalization trends that have um, driven markets for decades are being um, reversed. We're seeing a new world order potentially emerging. I'm curious to understand from a longer term perspective how um, your clientele is um, working through that. I think this is a, it's a complex world with multiple layers and multiple events happening at the same time. And uh, I think we're working very closely with our clients to actually guide them through this. At the end of the day, it comes down, again, to very simple truth. It comes down to the question, how resilient is the U.S. economy, uh, after all? And the U.S. economy has always proven itself resilient uh, 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 over, over the last century and, and found, find a way for relatively fast recovery. I think the, the elections next year obviously pose an interesting event, uh, an inflection point with that. But uh, looking at the strength, for example, of uh, what's happening around the IRA and uh, uh, the U.S. being able to implant new industries, new companies to attract them, uh, I think you never should discount the U.S. economy. Hmm. Uh, Europe, I think the fundamentals are there, but the question is what's, what's sort of the path out of the current situation? Uh, again, I mean, Germany has, has been the engine of Europe for a very long time. Right now it is not and uh, it will have to work and find a new path out of that. And uh, I think that's, that, 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 that is a bit more uncertain. Obviously, there are specific opportunities also in the current environment. And then one of the big questions for us uh, with, with Asia as the second home market, obviously, is, uh, uh, is how will China see through uh, its current challenges and when what will be the growth rate in the, in the years to come? even though I think it will always have positive growth, but obviously there's a difference in, in potential speeds. 
and uh, there, there's still some short-term challenges in the real estate sector that the country has to master. So um, I think there's a, there's a lot of uncertainty. This is not a time to take big bets. I think it's a time to navigate this tactically. There are enough investment opportunities for clients, but more on a, let's say, specific level. On a, we, we, we said on the equity side on a stock picking level rather than on a, rather than on a, on, on a big macroscopic level. Um, and, and we have to work through this step by step. So um, one sort of more longer term question I have in, in terms of what you're seeing um, and, and what the, geo, the heightened geopolitical tension is, is leading to. Is de-dollarization a thing among rich clients? I don't think that will happen so fast. At the end of the day, I mean, all the points of deglobalization or de-dollarization, at the end of the day, yes, I think they, they provide an extreme scenario, but the reality, I think, will be much more differentiated. Um, I'm, 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 I'm not seeing that as a, as a large global trend. Okay. And you mentioned China and Asia. Uh, we've seen a record, I think, $12 billion of dollars worth of foreign investors putting, you know, of money pull, being pulled out of stocks in China by foreign investors in August. Um, the economy is sputtering, as you say, and, you know, there are some questions as to whether this is structural and not cyclical. Where does that, you know, how does that outlook affect, um, you know, Judas Baer's opportunities there and in Asia more generally? We still have a, an optimistic, let's say, long-term outlook in the sense that the growth potential for China is substantial. And China has proven times and again, and I think it has been almost an economic miracle in the last uh, few decades that that, that, that that has happened there. Uh, uh, and bringing that amount of people out of poverty through economic development. And I think the fundamental forces at work they have not changed. Uh, um, I think that, that China will do everything to find back to growth. And uh, I see this also very closely in Hong Kong. Since the reopening of Hong Kong after, after the pandemic, I think the efforts that go into rebuilding uh, velocity in the economy are very, very substantial. And I would never underestimate that. In that sense, we have a confident stance to, uh, to, towards Asia. We, have, we are very strong as Julio Spare uh, in, the bo in both centers, in Singapore and in Hong Kong. We have moved uh, relatively recently into a new office building in Hong Kong, I think underpinning our long-term growth ambitions in the region. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think we will be steadily investing in North Asia and Southeast Asia as we believe that, uh, that, that, that the long-term potential for the region is absolutely impacted. And does that include onshore China, where I think you've got a, a JV in the asset management space? We have a very strong strategy today offshore from Hong Kong and from Singapore, and that is going to remain the bedrock of our activities for China. I think we're extremely well positioned in, in, in both hubs, and especially in Hong Kong, as we sense, let's say, a longer-term convergence of, of Hong Kong with the Greater Bay Area, with Shenzhen, with, with, with the big cities in, in the south of China. Um, I believe that this is the right place for us to be. We want to understand what's happening in the mainland. I think our small investment in, uh, in, 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 in Grow as an asset manager and a distributor uh, is an interesting way of testing and learning, but it will by no means replace our cross-border strategy uh, that we continue to run out of Hong Kong and Singapore. So for now, it's fair to say we shouldn't expect a large investment in growing the onshore business in China? Not from our side, no. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, and what about sort of more generally the growth opportunity? Um, you say, you know, it, it's unchanged, but, you know, we are seeing, um, you know, we, we are, you know, we are seeing the competition also reevaluate um, parts of parts of Asia. W where do you stand on that? I think we, we, we tend to take a very long term view at developing our business. And it's I, I always smile at this uh, when we say we are in the business of serving families over generations and then uh, uh, some players are looking at resourcing decisions or at opening or closing offices on a, on a few year cycle. I think that's just the, those two things, they just don't go together. I mean, we've been building our presence in Asia over the last two decades and uh, this is, we're, we're there definitely for the long term. That is true for the entire network uh, where, where Julius Baer operates. And we today have, let's say, 10 focus markets across the globe that allow us with a di to have a diversified base uh, and to benefit from, let's say, uh, local growth as these growth rates move up and down uh, with some cyclicality uh, across the network. 
um, that allows us to be, in, uh, to be there for the long term. And so uh, we, we don't let our long term plans typically influence by, by, by short term fluctuations. We obviously take tactical decisions, we can, but that's what a, a broad network and a diversified network is for. Right, well, maybe we can talk about something closer to home, um, mm -hmm. Switzerland. And for a long time, I think some, some say being Swiss was almost all you needed to do to be a successful Swift, Swift wealth manager. You had, but in a very short period of time, you've had um, potential erosion of the unique selling points. You've had the end of bank secrecy. You've had what some perceive to be sort of a cautious move away from um, neutrality. And you've had... Obviously, um, in the spring, with the demise of Credit Suisse and the tumult that followed, you had, you know, the, the, the specter of financial instability uh, was, you know, showed its head here, and you know, the, the, it, Switzerland was, was somewhat rocked by, by that instability. Um, to what degree would you say that Switzerland has lost its luster as a, as a wealth management center? I don't see that erosion of the unique selling points, and, uh, and I allow myself a very differentiated perspective on that. Fine. <laughs> First, let's say the strength of the Swiss franc, of the Swiss economy, of the Swiss political system has been there and is there. And I think this is the foundation to be the preeminent number one financial place for cross-border wealth management, which is today's position, was yesterday's position, is a position that I think for Switzerland is absolutely defendable. I think that is, that is one element. Uh, the topic of neutrality, I think Switzerland has always had an active approach towards its neutrality, also in the last century. Switzerland has uh, uh, taken on sanctions uh, uh, by the international community also in the past against, uh, against specific states, and I think, frankly, Ukraine is at our doorstep. And we've had tens of thousands of refugees from Ukraine coming here to Switzerland. Uh, 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 just doing nothing has nothing to do with neutrality in that way. And so... I believe this was a, a, a logical step for Switzerland. And then taking the recent events, I think, yes, you can look at it as instability. I think there has been instability, and it obviously, I think, has, a, has, has, has created a sort of shock in the financial community that this happened uh, to all of us. On the other side, it should also be seen, and it is seen across the globe, that on Monday morning after the announcement that UBS was taking over Credit Suisse was made, and there was an announcement, hey, it was not done, the markets were opening in a completely orderly fashion. There was uh, uh, no cheaters and there was no dip. And I think in that way, Switzerland has managed out of its own force um, to resolve a problem with a globally systemically relevant bank, the first of its kind, and, uh, and done so without any disruption to the market. And I think that is very strongly seen, seen across the globe. And I think that's a testament to the strength of Switzerland. That's a long introduction to say that I think none of the fundamentals have eroded. I think on the other side, obviously, Switzerland continuously has to run and run faster to uh, uh, retain its advantage and to, re to remain as relevant as we have been. I think we've demonstrated that after the fall of the Swiss banking secrecy. Today, the financial place is stronger than it was at that time. And I think there's absolutely nothing in the way for us, based on the strong fundamentals, to continue on that path moving forward. 230 banks, more than 100 wealth management banks, I think that's quite an innovation ecosystem uh, where I'm confident that we're going to win. But you talk about, you know, needing to sort of keep that fresh. And so, so what does Switzerland need to do to stay ahead and maintain that position, would you say? The same as we try to do at a microscopic level as a company, uh, continue to innovate, stay relevant for clients, making sure that we follow the needs of our clients and our business has evolved massively from single line brokerage to portfolio management to holistic advice over the last decades. Uh, a big topics around digitalization, AI, what's going to happen next. I don't think it will replace trust, but we have to change, con constantly change our business. Generational change is a huge topic, and it is happening in a much more fluid way than people think. It's not like money is going all to, the, 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 all to Gen Z. It's like the 70-year-old becoming 80, getting 80-year-old and then giving, passing money to 60-year-old and bringing the next generation online more gradually. But that's, uh, that's always happened, right? Well, yeah, but that's happening in, in an accentuated way right now. I think we, we see a faster generational transfer right now, mm -hmm. uh, also with the, with, with the shift in demographics. And that's a big, big trend in wealth management. I think, again, Swiss banks, uh, as all global banks, will have to, will have to follow that trend and, and anticipate uh, uh, what to do. Um, and then it's always about being in the right markets, having the right solutions. Uh, as I said, staying relevant for clients. Um, that, we're, we're running fast as a company, 
and uh, our developments front, mid, back pay into this kind of transformation. And I think that's what has to happen at the level of the financial center. Plus the elements of the ecosystem, the very close collaboration of the banks with politics, with other stakeholders, with uh, our excellent education system, with uh, NGOs. I think Switzerland has a fantastic ecosystem that we can leverage. And, and we'll get to politics and, and regulation in just a bit, but um, I wonder if you, I can get you to make a prediction. So if I'm not mistaken, about a quarter of the world's uh, cross-border wealth assets are managed from Switzerland at the moment. Where will that number be in five and ten years? Well, I don't know, but uh, we will be working <laughs> no, no, to you, defend... I need a prediction. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> the, the one prediction I can give is uh, we uh, will do everything to defend our number one position. I think we have a few close competitors behind, but if Switzerland runs fast enough, I believe in, 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 in this world and in a very complex world, we can defend and extend on that position. So what's the prediction? Uh, number one. Um, thank you. Now, um, to, in order to do that, the sort of the, the financial stability and financial supervision need to be, you know, part of that, part of that solution and part of that attracting um, attract, attraction. Um, and the demise of, of Credit Suisse um, was very, you know, the final chapter was very unfolded very rapidly, but mm. it was potentially a very long time in the making. Yeah. Um, so what is it that didn't work in supervision, would you say? I think we all would like to have and, and want to have a, a much closer understanding of what happens. And I'm very glad that, uh, let's say, first report or the report by the Swiss Finance Department and the Expert Commission is already out that identifies uh, a, a number of weaknesses and things that have uh, happened in the short term, but also in the longer term. Uh, other reports are still outstanding, for example, the Parliamentary Commission uh, in Switzerland. I think it's very, very important that we all have the same and full fact base to, uh, uh, to have that picture on what went wrong and why it went wrong, and to use this ultimately then also as a basis for the right, let's say, regulations, adaptations, and the strengthening of the system. But, but sorry um, to interrupt, the inquiry is going to happen all behind closed doors, so... Um, the report of the financial uh, department is, is online, it's actually even uh, right. translated into English right now, So, which t always but takes a bit separate. of time in Switzerland. Yeah. But uh, uh, I think it's, it, this is already online right now, so there we have been working pretty fast. I think w w what has happened, um, I th if we if we really step back, I think there have been that there are different questions in the room. The most fundamental question, obviously, is a question of trust, and we see the relevance of trust in banking, and that uh, this cannot be regulated, as the federal council rightly said so at, at that press conference in March. And uh, uh, as you said, I think this has been in the making for a very long time. I think a, a combination of different elements. And uh, one of the big questions moving forward is how can we how can we address those much longer term elements like a strategy, like profitability, like uh, retaining market trust that is not easily regulatable just through a number of KPIs such as capital or, or liquidity. Mm -hmm. I think that's one element. Second element is more around the technical uh, uh, parts of regulation like liquidity. Does Switzerland need a public liquidity backstop as it exists in other countries? I think that's a matter of political debate right now. And where do you, where do you stand on that? And I believe we need one. Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, this should be an instrument to uh, keep a, a otherwise viable bank, uh, an otherwise viable bank uh, 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 safe. I think we will see higher velocities in money moving forward. Right, but we saw basically what were uh, bank runs spurred yeah. by social media. How, yeah. do you, how do you regulate for that? Well, not just social media. I think that, that, that it, uh, you cannot regulate that, but you can create the proper backstop to ensure that you can mitigate the um, you can mitigate the impact. I think that's and, the, and how the one would thing. that backstop be? The, the PLB, is, the PLB. Uh, is, 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 a, is a commonly known mechanism, and I think we don't have to reinvent the wheel mm -hmm. for that. Liquidity is one topic. Um, then obviously the whole question of, uh, of, of governance and supervision, how should FINMA, the National Bank, the mm -hmm. Finance Department work together, now especially in light of regulating a very big bank here in Switzerland right. with, with, with UBS and still retain proportionality for the, for the smaller banks. These are all topics that need to be addressed. And you see me not hip shooting and saying we should do this, we should do that. I think except maybe PLB is, is a topic that has been for a longer time in the making. Let's see this through. But uh, it makes sense to step back and say what worked, what did not, uh, before just shooting at something and creating sort of a, a false sense of security that is not going to help us, help us in the next crisis. 
And, and speaking of what worked and didn't work, it doesn't seem like resolution at the end was, was an option. Um, what, what's the takeaway then? I you think know? that's one of the questions. Why has it not been chosen? Right. Or why was another option chosen? I think we don't have the, the transparency on that right now. Mm. And without the fact base, it's very, it, 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 it's, it makes little sense to speculate. So you think it would be helpful to have that transparency I on resolution? Yeah. The more transparency we, we have on what happened and why were certain paths chosen, uh, the better we will be in a position to, for example, further develop the TBTF framework, which right. is not just a challenge for Switzerland, I think, which is a, a question for the globally systemically Absolutely. relevant banks. And, and do you feel, do you have the confidence and the comfort that you will get that transparency? I think there's a lot of intent to create that transparency, yes. And there's ultimately, I think, the, the, the Switzerland and the, the world will benefit from that. And uh, I hope we will see that through. Um, you mentioned UBS, and obviously it, it has now become much bigger. You know, the, the, it's got a balance sheet that dwarfs the size of the um, Swiss economy. Um, from your standpoint, is UBS too big for Switzerland? I think at the end it all depends on the strategy of UBS and its positioning and on the way how it conducts its business. And uh, I mean, we've seen a huge transformation of UBS since 2008, since the financial crisis. We've seen UBS tackling in a very determined way uh, its challenges and, uh, and, and focusing on wealth management and in a way de-risking its business. With that, I think uh, at least there's a, based on their historic performance, there's proof points that they can transform a business. And the question is really, what will UBS become? And um, in that sense, I think uh, a big UBS can be very good for Switzerland. You can, uh, having big banks in Switzerland at the time, UBS and CSN, now UBS, is something important also for the financial place and, and allows us, uh, 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 let's say, to, uh, to connect to the world in a different way than just through small banks. Um, in that sense, I see absolutely a path towards a very constructive future in that, in that setup. And then the other thing is, what will happen with the other banks? And if you look at the 230 banks in Switzerland, this is also not a static environment. And uh, looking at the wealth managers like ourselves, like, uh, like, like some others in the market, um, we also have doubled our size uh, since, or more, since the events of 2008. And so, there's, a, there's a, a constant evolution, I think, in the overall Swiss banking landscape. This is not just about the big player, it's really about how the entire banking place will evolve. And, and we'll get to that in, in, a, in a second, but just one more question on, on the size of UBS. I mean, as a trading counterparty, does their size worry you? And have you reviewed their, your exposure to mm. UBS? There are many very big institutions around the globe. And um, I think uh, UBS will not be the biggest bank of the world. And in that sense, no, that does not worry me. Okay. Um, you mentioned, obviously, the, the consolidation, the growth that we've seen in the market, um, in Switzerland including. Um, and I, I wonder for yourselves, um, in terms of where you see the company going, is the $1 trillion mark still, in assets under management, still a target? It has never been a target. Uh, and it's nice that people take it for that, but what we said, and we were very explicit about that in 22 when we uh, updated the new strategy cycle, also the chairman when he talked about this year, is that there's nothing in the way of Julius Baer becoming a one trillion company one day in the 2030s. We always said that size, uh, obviously, and scale matters, but AUM is not, and, and AUM and with that linked net new money, I think, should not be the sole driving force for a strategy moving forward. This is much more about having a, a, a holistic profitability in the right business. On the other side, wealth management is a growth market. We are a growth company. Uh, we have proven that over the last decades. And if you take the long term, uh, a, a long-term horizon, there's nothing in the way of us further gaining in scale in such a growing market across the globe. And that's, that, that's really the idea. So we want to have growth, but quality growth. We want to have growth, profitable growth. We want to have meaningful growth, uh, remaining that fully focused wealth manager for our private clients. So maybe target wasn't the, the right term, but it, it's still an ambition, shall we say, that, yes, okay. sounds can like I, it is. Or you can call it a thought hurdle. Huh? Uh, sorry. A thought hurdle. Mm -hmm. It's always important to, to set yourself a hurdle above which you jump. 
because it gives you an order of magnitude, it gives you also the requirements uh, that, that you need to make this work in terms of, for example, the scalability of your business. Uh, but it also shows you what you don't want to be. And in that sense, we, we are very specific about what we want to be and what we don't want to be. So how do you get there? How do you get there? A uh, combination of organic growth, uh, different vectors. Hiring in the market is an important step. I think uh, wealth management will always be a talent-driven industry. And uh, you've seen this in our half-year results, and we continue to push ahead. Uh, uh, I believe we have found a way back into growth mode last year and this year. And we're using the organic opportunities across the globe that we have. So, so just to follow up on that, you've hired, is it about 300 in, in no, the we did, we, we, No, 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 not, not, not that many. Um, but what's the sort of trajectory for the next no, uh, sort of year? Uh, I, th I think I think it, we, we will we will probably stay below the 200 for this year, but it, it's going to be on the gross hiring side, and I think that's going to be still a, a very substantial intake that we can make of, of, of new people across the globe from various sources. Sorry, that's 200 for uh, for this year for yes. 2023. But I think very diversified and uh, geographically diversified, diversified uh, in terms of the institutions where we are getting the talent from. This is all part of our long term talent development, obviously leveraging some of the short-term events that we have out there, but it's actually part of a, of, of, of a bigger and a long-term plan uh, uh, that, that, that we have. So return to growth this year, and we will see opportunistically how we will play this as we go into, uh, into 24 and 25. Uh, organic growth through hiring is going to be an important piece. The second piece that's going to be important is development of our own talent. And I always said that at the half year, at the strategy updates, very, very important that uh, we have to make the generational change happen and we now have the critical mass to develop our own talent base. Associate relationship manager programs, graduate programs, we have a number of programs that will allow us to move uh, uh, the, the, the own talent development to scale. And again, I don't want to be seen this to be seen as a target, but we said again in the 2030s, it would not surprise me if we were able to develop half of the people that we need at the front, and maybe also in the, on the investment side, from our own sources rather than hiring in the market. But that's, that's just a, a, an idea of that. Uh, this, this is the plan A, that's the organic route. Uh, obviously uh, accompanied with technology to drive scalability, to tap into new, uh, uh, into new client needs. And then the, the plan B, the remote plan B, obviously, is M&A, where we have demonstrated in the last decade that we can do it. But in absence of any meaningful objectives, plan A is clearly in focus. So, for, but for M&A, is there um, a sort of a, um, a target size that makes it less worthwhile, given sort of the, you know, the difficulties in integration? And um, there are not that many players out there that will get you close to the the one trillion mark. Again, the mar uh, I think the one trillion mark is not that far away. If you do, let's say, uh, uh, if you draw a development path, assuming, let's say, net new money generation in line with what has been achieved in the past years, if you take a bit of positive market performance, I think different lines into the 2030s can be drawn that the, the, the one trillion mark doesn't seem out of reach at all. And so the question is open whether you need or not any inorganic steps even on that, on that route. It's then more a matter of timing. That's just as a general statement. I think today M&A market is still dead putting it uh, uh, very bluntly over the last well, few years. Very big deal in this market. <laughs> in, 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 in wealth management, everyone is and wants to be in wealth management and everyone mm -hmm. sticks to it. Uh, even those players who are not as efficient, not as effective as others. And uh, this has not changed recently. Mm -hmm. And in terms of specific assets, I mean, was there anything at Credit Suisse you would have liked to buy? I think, again, we have a very clear strategy. We are a pure wealth manager. We're serving high net worth and ultra high net worth uh, clients. I think that this is a business that is best developed in a very specific manner and adding only elements that completely fit our business model, our strategy and our culture. Mm -hmm. Adding a universal bank into, or universal banking elements into such a focus player make no sense. No, no, I mean parts of Credit Suisse that you might have liked and did you look at them closely? Uh, I think we are always looking at all the opportunities out there, but I think we have different avenues to get there. And uh, uh, we are developing the business, uh, I think in a, in, a, in a very focused way uh, as we speak. And what about EFG? 
no comments on all the speculations that have always been really out for really all out. the years. That's it. That's our headline. Uh, it's, uh, it, 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 anyway, but um, yeah, the market is, uh, the M&A the market, again, is, is very, very inactive right now. And I've said that many times. I think the focus has absolutely to be on organic development. Mm -hmm. um, thought we might just dwell a little bit more on the on the sort of the history, uh, the, the recent history at Julius Baer. Um, it was sort of censured by the regulator, by FINMA, a few years ago um, for, you know, failings in combating money laundering. And just trying to get a feel from you far, how far the company is and the trajectory to, to sort of improving those controls um, to where you want them to be. Um, a big part of our work in the last three or four years has been to fundamentally change all the aspects of risk management at Julius Baer. And in a way, when you, when you take the analogy of building a high-rise, of adding new floors and then new reinforcements so that we have a very strong basis for future growth. Yes, when I was appointed CEO in 2019, I think uh, uh, we've been entering into a remediation program with FIMA at the beginning of 2020. Is that uh, all over now, by the way? That is over. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, the M&A ban was already over after one year. Yes. But by now, I think all the requirements have been completely fulfilled. Okay. This has come with very significant investments in all aspects of risk management. This has come with a complete revamp of the risk organization. And uh, I've, I'm very confident that the basis on which we operate right now is, is, is the right place to be uh, to, su to support, to sustain uh, highest quality future growth moving forward. This said, and I kept, keep saying that, this is always a risk business. And I think we will always have individuals, be it employees, be it clients, trying to abuse the financial system. We see that across the globe. I think what has fundamentally changed is our speed to detect abuse and our ability and our speed to remediate when we find it. And uh, I think that is, that, that is something that doesn't stop today in 2023. We continue to invest. We continue to invest on the anti-money laundering side, in understanding our clients' uh, uh, behavioral-based uh, uh, elements. And uh, it's going to keep us busy in the years to come, but it's very, very important for us as a basis for future growth. Um, but in terms of where you want the organization to be, um, would you say you're like 80% of the way there, 90% of the way there? Give us a sort of a, some, some color for sort of... There's no, there's no absolute. I think we're today exactly where we should be in terms of having a very clearly defined risk appetite, having the right risk organization uh, in the first, in the second, in the third line of defense, uh, having the right technologies in place and the right programs to develop new technologies. I think if I look at the 23, I think it's exactly what we wanted to do. But again, I think we take our ambition level 24, 25, 26, and we know that we will make additional steps. So the race is on every year to continuously develop. You mentioned tech, and I have a, a couple of tech-related questions. One is AI. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it's been sort of the, the talk of the year. It's fueled the rally in stock markets, the potential for AI. And I'm curious to hear what you see as the biggest impact to the company from adopting more AI, and particularly to the bottom line. I think we don't know yet. In a way, it's interesting that AI is I think in 10 years' time, we'll be looking back. Uh, I see your iPhone here. And I remember the time when there were no iPhones. And I think at that time, we could not imagine how transformative this would be to our daily lives in a positive and sometimes in a negative way. And it see feels to me that we are at the same junction when it comes to AI. We cannot, we cannot imagine today what the ultimate applications and possibilities of this new technology will be and what will be the impact on human learning, maybe even on human society. I think this is, this, is, this is really big. Looking at it from a company perspective, the most important thing is to, to work with it, to develop an understanding and to do this in an intelligent and gradual way to create options uh, for the future and to be part of those developments, to have the right talent that can bring us into the next generation. That's why we're experimenting with it in our uh, innovation lab in Singapore called the Launchpad, uh, a very nice place, uh, uh, a bit techy, but uh, very dynamic, and we were trying new technologies, new approaches uh, uh, to, solve, to solve certain problems. We apply it in areas that are very down-to-earth, like we just talked about compliance, anti-money laundering, uh, uh, doing transaction monitoring, 
we've been using self-learning algorithms in this space for a long time, and that will evolve into more AI-type applications. We've been using it to, to develop and identify business opportunities. Uh, and so we have a dozen different small pilot seeds areas where we're working with the technology to see how far we can push the envelope. And it's going to be an amazing journey, I'm sure, for in the next years. But are you at the point where you're already seeing the potential for um, increasing um, your, your savings targets from it, from, from applications? I mean, you know, some executives we speak to have told us, wow, you know, I've figured out I can, you know, save all this money on, you know, trading and, um, you know, I don't balancing think portfolios and... I don't think it's that easy, frankly. And, and those who say that they already see that, I'm, I, have, I, have <laughs> a few, them. I have a few question marks around that. I think, I think we might, we always tend to overestimate change potential in the short term and underestimate it in the long term. Mm -hmm. And that looks to me like being more in the former category. Um, I think, yes, of course, some things can be facilitated. I mean, uh, summarizing an 80-page complex report with a lot of data Today's uh, uh, large language modules can do that in a highly effective and efficient way. Translations today already, I think, using, uh, 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 using technology are so much more efficient than 10 years ago when a human being had to, uh, to retranscript everything into a different language. I believe that that's where we see already the benefits and that's where immediate savings are possible. The other side is that wealth management will always be a trust-based discipline. And when I look at our overall business model, I think the human contact, uh, the ability to, to create and maintain human trust is going to be extremely important. And no algorithm can sort of save that away. I think the algorithms can ultimately transform the way how we do chores and how we, and on what level we play the game but I think it will take a more fundamental reconstruction of the value chain to see the full potential of that. So if you have, say, for argument's sake, 100 people today, you know, running the organization in 10 years, will that, how, how will AI, do you think, change that number? It'll be 50, it'll be 75? Again, you're asking for a lot of crystal ball rubbing. Yes. <laughs> um, I like to use the historic uh, analogy of when I joined Julius Baer in 2004 and set foot on the trading floor, there were 150 people out there and maybe two IT guys somewhere around and a few programming tech savvy uh, traders. Today, uh, we have a third of our staff on and around the trading floor do have a technology background. Mm -hmm. and that's what happened in less than two decades. I think we're going to, be, to see a similar development in certain areas where technology will play, obviously, a much bigger role. Um, but uh, I think, again, all of these transformations will not happen in a linear way. And what I've never seen is that a new technology is immediately bringing savings. Usually, a new technology is, at first, an additional spend. It will allow uh, the business to scale and to attract new clients and to serve new needs. Uh, but the old business will stay on for a relatively long time and only gradually be substituted. So these transformation paths, if people tell you they're linear, they're not. Just go back um, for a second to sort of the, you know, the discussion we had earlier about you know, expansion and, and consolidation. Um, and it, it strikes me that you know, in the six months since you know, the big upheaval here, since the combination between UBS and Credit Suisse, um, you know, if you look at the, the market reaction, um, UBS shares are up 20%, I think, and I think Julius Baer are about flat. What does that tell us? I think we we I tend to look at our share price in the long term, and I like the development that I've seen certainly during my time as CEO, but actually in a much longer arc. Uh, we like uh, we have created a lot of value for our shareholders. We have done that through the appreciation of our share price, but also through very significant distributions, which we, by the way, have increased in the last few years. Uh, the uh, progressive dividend policy plus share buybacks. And uh, in that sense, from a total value to shareholder perspective, I'm very happy with the development that we've seen at, at Julius Baer. Uh, I mean, all eyes are right now on UBS, all eyes ob obviously right now on the economics of, the, of, of that integration, and I would, I would take this almost as an anomaly, I think, in, 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 and comparing this against the company just on a, on a normal and long-term development path uh, is a bit like, 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 like apples and pears. Yet, I think what, what we are mindful is long-term value creation for all stakeholders, 
and uh, our focus on shareholders continues to be strong. But, but to get there, is it fair to say that you know, it is an industry in which you need depth and breadth and therefore scale will continue to matter and matter more? This is why we're very happy with uh, our, let's say, ability to scale up in the last 10 years. This is why uh, our growth of the 2010s matters. And this is why our strategy moving forward is again a strategy of growth. Uh, what is also important, though, and that, that I'm 200% uh, convinced, is that that growth has to be highest quality growth, has to be profitable growth. Today and tomorrow, it's going to be even easier to attract assets and, and show headline growth uh, of assets and of top line without creating real value and without a chance to ultimately monetize uh, uh, this substrate that is, that, 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 that is generated. And this is why I think the strategy that we formulated in 1920 is the, is the right one, and we'll definitely continue on that path. Great. Um, I think we might be coming up to um, time for questions from the audience. Uh, so we've got a mic um, going around. Please put up your hands. I don't think it will ultimately affect the wealth industry because wealth industry has always been hyper fragmented and if you look at the combined market shares of UBS and CS, I think that will not give them a dominating role neither in Switzerland nor across the globe. I see there more of a development. I think, yes, I said historically it's great to have two ba large banks. Now we have one and uh, that's just the situation in, in which we are. I think, we, yes, we have to watch uh, a, a competition, especially in areas like corporate banking. Uh, uh, for example, for SMEs, but where I think that, that foreign players, other players might well come into the market and, uh, and, 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 and seize the opportunity for, uh, for more diversification, uh, I think typically markets will take a natural path to, to, to restore that, especially in financial services, which, which, is, which is fragmented. Um, no, I don't think it will directly affect wealth management, but it may create more opportunities, more space, let's say, for wealth managers like ourselves, we're today the second largest bank by market cap uh, in, in, in Switzerland, and I think that gives us a new platform from which to develop our business moving forward. Uh, Philip, you were talking about um, wealth management being trust-based discipline, but then I have a question about young generation, because I believe for them, they only value digital securities and they don't care about brands, they don't care about trust, about their RM being available for them. What is your view on this and what is the answer of Julius Burr on these challenges? I believe they care very much about trust <laughs> and they just, I think, the one thing does not exclude the other. Yes, the young generation will not go to a bank teller to do uh, basic chores and yes, they want to access their portfolio on Sunday afternoon, 2 p.m., which is only possible through technology. On the other side, and we see this in working actually with the young generation, that trust, especially for large scale and, 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 and life determining decisions, uh, a trust requires human interaction also for that generation. We have a, a young partners community across the globe with more than a thousand young people. These are the children and the grandchildren of our clients. And uh, we use them not just to inspire them and drive their financial literacy, but also to learn from them and see what they need. And taking every interaction with them and, and all their inputs into our further development, I think the right balance between human trust and, and technological capabilities is going to be key. Uh, and let's not forget, I think that many, a lot of the, let's say, the larger scale wealth high, but also ultra high net worth wealth uh, across the globe is structured with a lot of complexity, with uh, family assets, with uh, our complex multi-jurisdictional family situations. But I think that's also something that cannot easily be automated and put into a framework. That's where human expertise, uh, together with the trust, play a very, very important role in, in creating a stable frame for the long term. And I think that's one of the key disciplines for wealth managers like Julius Baer, where we can add value to those families. And the young generation is extremely aware of that. We have a question there. Yes, good morning. Thank you for taking my questions. Uh, you were talking about uh, 200 uh, add addings in terms of gross hiring this year. 
is this now an exceptionally high number because of the opportunities created by the cheaters around Credit Suisse? Or uh, is this kind of a number we can also assume for, let's say, mid to longer term annually? And then uh, secondly, what does this mean in terms of net hiring? I said up to, so uh, the exact number we will see at the end of the year again, what matters most there is quality. I also said and say again, diversified sources. I think this is not a, a, a specific Credit Suisse hiring strategy. Yes, I said before, we have to some extent benefited, obviously, from uh, the movements that have been created by Credit Suisse uh, as early as last year. But we continue to hire in the long term and according to long term plans and, and also leveraging long term relationships in all the key markets uh, where we're present. And uh, I think this, this diversification of growth is something very, very important. Yes, this is a return to a relatively high and fast hiring speed. We've experienced this last in the years after the Merrill Lynch integration. You may remember that uh, after the transaction, we've entered a phase of accelerated organic growth and hiring. Um, uh, we may not come into that territory, but I think uh, uh, for us, we, we're very consequently implementing what we told the market actually since last year, that we're moving back into, into growth mode and we're, we're leveraging on the opportunities that present themselves out there in the market. We see Julius Baer being a very attractive place for top talent. Um, we can be selective and we can uh, bring in the right talent in the right place. And uh, for sure that's going to play out over the coming years uh, also in terms of growth. Oh, you, you all know, I think this is it's always a, a long horizon in terms of finding the right talent, but then also materializing the business cases. But uh, I'm glad that we could accelerate this to some extent now in 2023. I have another question on growth, if I may. Um, sure. You didn't talk about the US hmm. and the opportunity for growth there and how you, how you plan to be looking at it. I think Two large onshore markets where we're not present, China, we've talked about it, and the US. Yeah. Uh, I think the US obviously is a, is a very large, is a very dynamic market. It's also a market with a hefty competition where, depending on the source, none or only a very few foreign players have ever generated true economic profit mm -hmm. through, their, uh, through their commercial activities. I think uh, in that sense, we believe that our global network that we have today, our focus markets, our broader market setup is, is more than sufficient to sustain the future growth. Uh, we talked about focus. We talk about focus in this, in this strategic cycle, focus, uh, 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 scale and innovate. And the part of focus is also uh, uh, making sure that we gain even more critical mass in the markets where we're already present. And uh, that's the strategy for the time being. Great, thank you. Any more questions? One there. And then. Around, um, the topic of future of wealth. Um, so you've talked about a lot of uh, trends, a lot of dynamics that are happening currently. Um, so if we go ahead, say 15, 20 years, um, could you maybe paint a picture how wealth management has changed? I don't know, in terms of interaction, in terms of product suits. Uh, topic at the moment is, for example, green investment, uh, sustainability. Um, and also what sort of what how, how bear might be able to position itself there and maybe there are certain topics you haven't touched on I think it's a it, it's, it's it's an interesting question in a way I, I would like to answer it from today's perspective because again I think uh, predicting what is going to be in 15 years is uh, either it's going to be a science fiction or it's uh, or it's going to be very superficial I think we have today a very interesting development that there's an, as you say rightly, enormous breadth of different topics and, and, and vectors uh, pointing into the future. And uh, in a way, it's, it's, uh, it's our today's challenge is to make sure that we can be part of those developments, we can understand them, we can bring them into our environment, and we still can be have sufficient focus so as not to uh, 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 spread the butter on too much bread and actually go, uh, go, go too wide. So we, we've taken a few conscious decisions along the way. Sustainability has been a very conscious decision where we said, yes, we want to be part of that. This is important to us uh, from a corporate perspective, uh, uh, making sure that we do our part, even though our footprint is relatively small. Uh, but then for our clients, this is why we've pushed forward with uh, things like reporting to clients about their portfolios, but also giving them choice and, uh, and, and explaining them, uh, driving their, their ecological uh, literacy uh, moving forward in the ESG space. 
and um, uh, we'll continue on that path. Very much focused on, on, on allowing the client to express their convictions in the best possible way. And so we, we take a specific sliver of this and, and we drive this forward with a, lot of, with a lot of determination. Other area where we've been sowing the seeds early on is in the digital asset space. Where you know we have an early collaboration with, uh, with, with an early uh, minority investment in SEBA. We've been developing our own capabilities in the last few years and actually have been seeing this through current crypto winter. Yes, we're fully aware this is not a time to promote this into a full-fledged asset class, but I believe in the long-term value of digital assets, and I also believe that maybe the, the, the asset type, the specific asset type that will be relevant in 10 years is not yet invented, but some of the technology is there, some of the processes are there, and we need to uh, develop on the path. We cannot jumpstart this in five or in 10 years, then it's too late. That's why we're developing the basic capabilities and are today among the very few banks uh, in the world who are able to bring complex assets like digital assets even in, uh, within limited scope into an advisory process for sophisticated clients uh, under full uh, MIFI II regulations in Europe. And uh, that's the path we continue, we continue on that line. Uh, third element uh, example is uh, very focused investments in private markets. Uh, uh, and while we will not become an asset manager, I think we've, we've made that very, very clear. We've been developing capabilities, for example, in the field of real estate, where we believe this, this is, is here to stay. And again, regardless of the immediate market cycles, uh, our clients will always use real estate as an asset class. And we want to have a deeper set of capabilities, and we gradually are, are, are building this. Like this, we're creating sort of a, a set of different options moving forward. And obviously, stay in England open to uh, what's going to happen in the market and, uh, and, and, and what new trends emerge. Philip, I think we might have two more questions if we can do them relatively quickly because we're coming up for time. All right, I'll try to be brief. Uh, first of all, thank you for taking my question. Uh, you have briefly touched upon the importance of technology and also about this uh, uh, shift of the new generation coming into, into place and uh, considerably also the increase in demand for speed of access, uh, transparency and also research for true value in the service that uh, a bank nowadays or wealth management solution nowadays need to provide. In consideration of this aspect, uh, what is your view on uh, uh, arising, let's say, technology solutions such as uh, well tech or digital platform which gives direct access to clients into the private markets or even digital banks which are nowadays increasing, increasing their playground not only into traditional trading assets but also uh, wealth management solutions. Do you see a threat, an, an opportunity to collaborate further or uh, uh, no impact at all? We've got about 30 seconds. We want to take that last final question from that other gentleman. I think it's changing the landscape in a way for good. Competition is good and new approaches are good. Are they going to replace wealth, wealth management? No. I think the platforms for private markets, they still require a lot of skill for the investor. It doesn't replace an advised setup that you can have in a wealth manager. And the fully digital neobank doesn't replace the human contact that you need for complex wealth structuring. But they attack some old, uh, let's say, profit pools. and They create a new dynamic in the industry. In that sense, it's positive to have that kind of positive, constructive competition coming in. Actually, I think we're done for questions, but one more, if I may. We talked a lot about companies and businesses. We didn't speak about you. Tell me, how does a master in biotech help you in your, in your job as CEO? Well, I think the one thing that ha I always had in my life is curiosity. And uh, probably that's what led me into biotech at a time when this was really not mainstream. It was the beginning of biotech in universities. Uh, I did a lot of other things afterwards. I, I, I always had the chance to, to, to satisfy my curiosity. And uh, I, mean, I think now I'm probably in the best possible position to continue expanding on that. Uh, one of the privileges being the CEO of Julius Baer is I see clients every day. And our clients have fascinating backgrounds. They have fascinating companies. They know everything about the world where I have so much to learn. And uh, being able to connect some of those dots and bring clients together uh, moving forward, I think that's, that's one of the most fascinating parts of my job. So curiosity has been the red line and I think uh, uh, also something that is at the, at, at, at the heart of our value proposition moving forward. And final, final. What does one do after this job? 
<laughs> uh, there is always a life after, you know, but right now my focus is exactly on this job. There's plenty of things to do, and I'm excited to, uh, to take them on. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, the audience. Um, our focus on wealth management continues this week. Please tune in on Thursday. We have uh, the DBS and EDB executives um, speaking to us in Asia. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Philip. <laughs> <laughs>